so good evening everybody and welcome to today's session on decoding poetry and today with us we have our guest speaker dr ram kulesh thakur from uh, uh, srm university amravati guntur andhra pradesh so before we start i would like to introduce dr ram kulesh thakur to all of you a bit about him so dr ram kulesh thakur whose main areas of interest are indian writing in english especially poetry and english language teaching especially for science and technology obtained his doctorate in 2013 from indian institute of technology ism dhanbad dr thakur has also been awarded mphil from the same institute he completed his ma in the year 2007 from vinoba bhave university hazaribagh He has authored several research papers and two books namely Ruskin Bond Interpreter of Human Relationships published in 2011 and Poetic Communication A Study of the Verbal Art 2015 Now assistant professor at SRM University AP Amravati Guntur Andhra Pradesh Dr Thakur has been actively involved in guiding cum training UG and PG students in enhancing their overall personality to meet the expectations of the future employer that is making them corporate ready and curriculum development so a warm welcome to Dr Ram Kulesh Thakur from all of us now without any delay i would now move on to Dr Thakur's lecture Uh, Dr. Thakur, over to you. Thanks, sir. I hope my voice reaches all of you. Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vasa has already introduced me. She took around two, two and a half minutes to introduce me. It was very simple. She was just supposed to say, "We have Ram with us." Anyway, thanks for that warm welcome. Actually, I'm not used to such formal occasions. i generally even engage my regular classes in a very informal communicative way and uh, what has been uh, the practice with me for the last four and a half years especially is uh, you know i'm i'm trying to move away from the established teaching learning pedagogies and i have been trying to get closer to the natural way of learning right so whenever there is a formal situation and uh, a formal platform such as this where i have this many audience and uh, you know the host formally welcomes me invites me you know i i start getting you know that a bit of uh, anxiety not anxiety actually goosebumps okay anyway i like i don't like to waste any further time so let's get started now before i start uh, you know sharing my experiences and sharing my ideas whatever i have gained in the last 10 to 11 years of my practice i like to declare one thing because that declaration is very important whatever i'm going to talk for the next 50 60 70 odd minutes please don't think that i'm trying to dictate or suggest or i'm trying to you know establish anything no my intention is not at all to uh, you know Uh, to force my opinion on uh, youngsters and i never intend to you know like mold or influence anybody to such an extent that they start blindly believing whatever the other person is saying right so as a learner you should always be ready to question whatever the other person is saying as a learner you should always be ready to learn or look deeper or look beyond whatever the other person is saying right so whatever i'm going to discuss in the next uh, say 50 60 minutes these are my personal experiences which i'm going to share with you and i will try my best to you know connect it with whatever experience you are having right now because i know in a span of 10 years a lot has changed a lot almost the entire world has changed right so i cannot enforce whatever i have experienced or the way i used to do things way back in 2006 and 7 i cannot expect the learners in 2020 and 21 doing the same thing okay so whatever i'm going to do whatever i'm going to talk whatever i'm going to discuss is my personal experience i'll try to connect it with you and then what i'm my basic intention is 
to help you break free from all the constraints that you have developed for yourself or we all develop for ourselves when we start following a lot of you know guiding principles when i say guiding principles what i mean is uh, there are a lot of critical theories a lot of literary theories a lot of professors a lot of lectures you listen to everybody right you listen to any one person for one hour and you'll get influenced and immediately the next hour you listen to some other person and you will find whatever the other person was saying was idiotic right the next day you listen to a third person and you find that no he is the best right so these all things do happen and it could happen because we all are human being okay so uh i have a very clear objective and the objective is i'm going to help you understand poetry and i cannot guarantee you that after listening to me for 50 or 60 odd minutes you'll be able to understand poetry but at least i can promise you if you are able to understand if you are able to take in whatever whatever i'm going to deliver in the hour in the coming hour at least you'll have you'll be better equipped to interpret evaluate understand and enjoy poetry and the key word is enjoy until and unless you enjoy poetry you know you will always fail to analyze and evaluate it now the problem is you know especially in indian system of education poetry is introduced to us in a such a narrative manner when i say narrative manner what i mean is uh, we used to read a poem or the learners read a poem and then there is a wise uh, professor standing on a dais and he gives you he gives you his or her critical interpretation of the poem and we all blindly follow it right we understand yes this is it there can be no other meaning to it right and that actually what we do is we murder poetry then and there yes poetry is murdered because poetry a poem is a living entity i have never believed that a poem is static a poem is fluid a poem is dynamic it keeps changing the same poem you read today in the morning hours is a different poem the same poem you read tomorrow in the evening hour it would be a different poem you read the same poem when you are upset it will give you a third say you read the same poem when you are very happy and ecstatic it will give you a different meaning so how do you say you are reading the same poem no you are not reading the same poem you are reading four different poems although the words the syntactics the semantics are the same but the pragmatics and discourse keeps changing okay so uh, and yes i can promise you one thing i'll try to refrain from big uh, technical terms i don't like them because i'm very scared of those big technical terms so i try to save you i i try to save you from all those difficult poetic and language terminologies i try to make it as lucid as simple as possible and i expect that uh, i should be able to do justice now so i i think i have already wasted not wasted i have consumed 7 minutes just to introduce my topic to you so what i am going to discuss with you is decoding poetry how poetry is to be decoded now the first thing you don't need a person to explain to you how to decode it because all of us are gifted equally all of us are smart enough to decode it on our own now the point is why should you listen to me then you should listen to me because i am older i have already done what you are trying to do and i can help you in some way or the other right so this is the only reason you should listen to me don't think that i have come here with a guru mantra or a formula that i give you and after that you will start analyzing all your poems on the formula that i'm giving you and you will come up with you know flying colors no it's not going to work like that okay so be very practical and uh, deviating a bit from the main topic that we are going to discuss you know the root cause of all problem in this world is expectations so if you are attending my lecture with a big expectation that this man is going to give me a formula with which i can decode any poem that he form you you are wrong it's not going to happen right so i'm just going to help you i'm going to make the process of poetic interpretation easier for you but i don't guarantee any such magic okay if the magic happens well and good if it doesn't i'll be so sorry but at least i can promise you one thing you will find yourself equipped better 
after this lecture. Okay, so let me start with the formal presentation. And let me inform you, uh, this is the first time I'm using Google Meet, so I'm not used to it. I have been using Zoom, so I might be a bit, you know, technically uh, not competent. Just a minute. I think this will work. Varsa, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. You'll have to press press now button. Just, just a minute. Just a minute. Varsa, I'm trying my best. And I'm a slow learner. Don't force me. Let me take my time. OK. I think this should work. I'm not getting that share button, Versa. Uh, OK, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, can you see the like the below thread? And there is a present now. Yeah, that I've already clicked. I've got a window. If you press, there are three options. You went your entire screen, a window, a Chrome tab. Just a minute, dear. Yeah. Right? Present there now. are three options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right now, if you yes. click your entire screen. OK. Or a window or a Chrome tab, whichever you want to select. You can select your entire screen actually. Yeah, I have selected entire screen, but I'm not getting that option of see. Now, 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 yeah. now there is your screen is visible, right? You will have to click on that screen. Okay, I'll click there. And then the share button will activate. Now the share button must be you know activated. No, unfortunately it's not. Okay, I'll I'll show you, I'll show you how to do it by sharing my screen. Okay. Is it visible now? I'll show you. No. No. I'll I'll tell you how to do it. Yes, I got it, Versa. Thank you, thank you. I got it. Yeah. Okay, great, 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 great. I think so. Are you getting my screen now? Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Can you read out the first you'll slide? You have to full screen. Just a minute. Yes, you'll have to you know make it full screen. Is it fine? Yes, absolutely fine. Okay, so my screen is visible now. Absolutely. Great. I'm so delighted. Thank you, Vasa, for helping me out. Okay. So uh, yes, as I've already introduced uh, the topic decoding for three. So, and let me inform you, this is an exclusive talk which I have prepared only for the set of audience that I have here. So, I have done a bit of my homework as well. Let's get started. Now, the approach. The approach that we are going to have in the next 50, 55 minutes, whatever time I consume, is very simple. I'm going to explain the mechanism of poetic language. That is how a poetic language is different from general language and what makes a poetic language poetic, right? And how it works. So what is the dynamics? What are the characteristics of a poetic language? And how the same language changes or assumes a very different behavior when used in poetry, okay? So that is what I mean by mechanism of poetic language. The next main area that I try to cover is the construction of discourse and its effect. Now. You need to understand one thing, as I have always said, as I said in the very beginning, the syntactics and the semantics, right? They generally remain the same, but the pragmatics and the discourse, they keep changing. Even if you're reading the same poem again and again and again, you read the same poem 10 number of times under different situations, or under different uh, moods, okay? With different people, a lot of variables are there which influences the meaning of the first way. Right. So if the pragmatics changes, the discourse effect gradually changes. OK, so you need to understand like how, you know, I'm just trying to give you the best of whatever I have learned in the in my past 10, 12 years of research. So what I find is when you are talking about a poem, a poem has four structures. You can discuss it at the sound level. That is the phonetics. You can discuss it at the word level, how the words are placed next to each other. That is the syntactics. You can discuss it at the meaning level, okay? How the meaning, when the words are placed one after the other, okay? How do they influence the entire meaning? For example, if I say a beautiful girl, it has definitely a feel, a beautiful girl. On the other hand, if I say 
the girl beautiful right now the best thing or the worst thing that you find is the poetic liberty a person engaging himself or herself a person writing or composing or creating a poem can go to any extent can take all liberty with language so when it comes to the language grammatical rules they are not that stringent when it comes to a poem right so that gives that extra bit of liberty to a poet than any other sort of uh, you know uh, a writer who tries to attempt any other genre of writing okay so the liberty the poetic liberty which a poet enjoys makes a poem more complex in nature okay so okay i'll i'll discuss it in detail later so phonetics you have understood the sounds like what type of sounds you are using in your poem like if you are using musical sounds like l m right it has a different effect if you are using dead and dull sounds like d d right fine it has a different effect if the sounds are repetitive it has a different effect if the sounds are you know slow and falling that has a different effect so you can even analyze and understand the feel you can get the feel of a poem by only analyzing it at the phonetic level by only you know you just have to do the stylistic analysis of the poems find out the different type of sounds that the poet has used and how the different sounds cluster together to create an effect right i'll i'll give you the best example for example when you listen to song when you listen to music even if you don't understand the lyrics but you you get that feel right and that feel is only because of the influence or the charm of the sound okay so you can understand a poem at the phonetic level you can understand it at the syntactic level as i said different words coming together in different formats right then semantics the meaning okay and then pragmatics pragmatics is all about the context right so the same poem can be placed on different contexts and you will find that it gives you completely a new story under different contexts when the context changes the entire meaning the entire story the entire discourse changes okay so i try to touch upon in whatever little time i have these four layers of a poetic language and then i'll try to sum up by giving you an overview how to understand poetic communication right so this is going to my approach this is going to be my approach in this talk and some of you must be thinking why is this fool here when i say fool i mean the person with that butcher knife i don't refer myself right so you you must be uh, thinking that when i'm talking about the approach why do i have a person with a butcher knife it is symbolical actually i wanted to communicate a message and the message is poetry is not dead a poem is a living entity it has a life you don't try to post mortem it right a post mortem is only performed after you know a post mortem is only performed on dead entities right after after something loses its life loses its essence a poem never loses its essence it's living and it lives forever so don't try to post mortem and when i say post mortem i refer to all those critics who apply very hard stringent critical theories and try to murder a poem okay so whenever you are trying to deal with a poem be delicate be sensitive feel the words feel the sounds get connected and that will lead you through the alleys which will give you the real joy and that is the objective of a poem look the first challenge that we all as students of literature these days are facing is with the changing mode of education with the changing world everything around us has changed actually poetry was never meant to be read poetry was never meant to be read poetry was always meant to be recited poetry was meant to be you know read aloud in the company of people right and when you recite a poem when you read aloud a poem you will find your sounds coming back to you and that gives you the real joy that creates an effect over you which is the basic purpose of poetry but these days we have locked up poetry in books it is printed imprinted locked up on white pages and 
whenever we you know like we are very depressed we just take out a book and we read a few poems but that is now that is not how it was supposed to be read right so uh, we are going to discuss these few basic things in the next 40 minutes okay so this person with the butcher knife suggests don't be brutal poem is a living entity treat it as a kid treat it as a living being don't try to force mortem it okay this is uh, the first request i have to all the learners who are making an attempt to understand poetry okay now now a bit of technicalities is uh, always uh, required otherwise my audience will think that i am a fool who is just trying to beat around the bush not giving you any actual information so here it comes looks very uh, you know academic just go through it anyhow i'll i'll explain it to you now what is my concept of poetic communication my concept of poetic communication is a poem is a communicative event you take up any poem whether it be two pages whether it be two words whether it be two statement whatever be the poem it is a complete entity this is the best part of a poem a poem is always complete a poem is never incomplete right so a poem is a communicative event in which the poet arranges words differently to communicate a different meaning that is what i said right the same words coming in different order will not create the same poem it might create another poem but it will never be able to create the same poem what sorry once you change the order of the words right so a poem is basically a communicative event which has a particular set pattern of words you are not supposed to interfere with the structure of the words if you interfere with the structure of the words then and there you kill that poem right so that is first thing the other thing the meaning differently arranged have different effects over the reader as i said when you change the context right the, let the words be in the same order but when you change the meaning which changes with the context definitely the effect and the impact okay and the influence and the reach of the poem changes as well now number 2 the poetic language is intensely concentrated when i say concentrated i means it's very dense it's very suggestive it's pregnant right it has a lot of meaning it has a lot of implied things which you need to very carefully dissect you know it, you, you just need to work like a surgeon works on an operation theater on an operation table right in an operation theater just like a surgeon uses his small surgical blade to cut through to open up an entire body you need to use your sense your what a little understanding you have for a tree to get into the deeper sections of it where you find the implied meaning and it can be easily done right it is not that difficult and i'll prove it to you how easy it is the only thing is that we never attempt we never make an attempt to understand poetry at our own level because we have a prejudiced mind which says i need to apply this theory i need to decipher the metaphors i need to make out what type of sounds or what type of structure it has i need to understand why the poet is saying so i need to understand what is the meaning of the poem no there is no need to do all these things you just you just get into the poem and the poem will gift you with all these things there is no need to make any extra effort which generally spoils the entire learning experience of the poem right okay number 3 one employs a great deal of rhetorical devices to make it interesting yes a poem is full of rhetorical devices poem is full of literary devices if you don't understand what is a metaphor if you don't understand what is a simile if you don't understand how the sounds work if you don't understand what is rhyming if you don't understand what is pattern then in that case you might find yourself in a bit of awkward situation while you are interpreting poetry because these all are the intrinsic characteristics which one must know when you are dealing with poetry so you need to understand it is only the rhetorical devices and the literary speeches literary devices that make a poem a poem 
So you should be aware of that. At least that you have to do. Okay. Now the next point is very important, and this is the master statement that I'm going to make for this presentation. Okay. Now look, as I said, a poem is just a construct of words, and you need to understand a word has three meanings. A word has three types of meaning. One is abida, the other is lakshana, and the third is vanjana. Now these are the Sanskrit as well as words. If you are a student of English literature, you can understand it as denotative, connotative. That is indication or abida. Implicate. Oh, I have already mentioned it on my slide. indication or abida implication or lakshana and the intention or vanjana which otherwise you can call as tatparya in hindi right so if you are able to understand a word at its three levels what is the denotative meaning what is the connotative meaning and what is the implied meaning i guarantee you you have decoded the poem then and there other than that you need nothing so if you are able to analyze the three the three vertices or the three if you are able to analyze a word from three different perspectives from three different angles one look at it from the denotative perspective what is the literal meaning suggestive meaning okay you have already deciphered the whole poem you will be able to understand what is the implied so abida lakshana and vanjana if you are able to understand that 90 Five percent of the job is already done, okay? Because whatever figures of speech, whatever literary devices, everything is composed of either the abida feature of the word, that is the indicative feature of the word, or the implicative feature of the word, or the implied feature of the word, right? So it is as simple as that. Now, before I get into uh, you know the critical analysis of a few poems. in order to make you uh, you know understand it better i'd like to discuss two terms one is sabda and the other is artha again these two words are from sanskrit as static even in hindi we use sabda and artha you need to understand the difference okay now sab is the word and arth is the meaning this is what we understand okay but this is according to the western philosophy sab is the word and arth is a meaning but let me inform you the fact is there is no meaning in the word right now it might sound a bit awkward to you but you just have patience i'll explain it to you uh, right now how what i mean a word has no meaning right uh, i i you can easily link it to the concept of sign and symbol or you can say signifier and signify from where does the meaning emerge the meaning emerges from the signify the meaning emerges from the symbol the meaning is the sign is just indicative it refers to it right so you find the same relationship between sub and earth right the same sub they can have different earth on the other hand if you say meaning the word must have the same meaning try to understand why why i'm saying uh, you know it is different okay the relationship between a word and the meaning is not the same as a relationship between a sub and artha artha is a wider concept okay artha is a bigger term so when i say artha the pragmatics comes into picture when i say artha the tone comes into picture right for example i'll, I'll just give you an example uh say suppose you are getting bored right now you are not happy with my lecture and all of a sudden you unmute yourself and you say sir it is such an enriching lecture i am so privileged i have gathered enough information now i'd like to leave right now your sabd is uh, you know the literal meaning of whatever words you are using suggest that you are giving me a compliment but the fact is you are not complimenting me instead you are trying to mock instead you are trying to ridicule instead you are trying to abuse right so that is the art so sometimes what happens is there is no direct relationship between the sub and the earth but the relationship between word and the meaning is always direct try to understand that okay so artha is a wider concept which encompasses a lot of other variables a lot of other factors which generally designate a particular concept a particular you know understanding to a word 
right? Like, like you know, if you have read some of the critical theories. Now, I was said that most of my audience would be like undergraduate students, so I don't want to use those technical terms. But there is a concept in uh, you know, uh, in one of the school of thoughts which says X is X only because X is neither A, B, C, D, E, F, Y, Z, right? So something is something only because it is not any other thing, right? So that concept, if you are able to understand or bring in that concept of a sign and a symbol, you will be able to understand the correlation between sub and earth. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll explain it later once we get into a few poems. Okay, yes. Now, what are we going to do? We are going to decode poetry and we are going to do it right now. As I have said in the last four and a half years of my teaching, what I've been practicing is activity based classrooms, right? I have stopped delivering lectures. I no more deliver lecture. I walk into my classroom with an activity. I introduce the activity. I get the learners involved and automatically in the process of, uh, you know, doing the activity, they learn. They learn even the most complicated terms or the concepts, which should be very difficult to teach them if I try to deliver a lecture, right? So that is what, you know, I'm going to apply the same code here as well. So I've just introduced a few basic things related to, uh, you know, in order to enrich your understanding of poetry. And just in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to get you involved. We all are going to work. We are all are going to decode a live living piece of poem. Right? Okay. So before we start doing that, I just want you to go through this slide, decoding poetry. Poets communicate their social awareness, keyword social awareness and understanding with linguistic subtlety and contextually determined code. Please keep a note of these two words, linguistic subtlety, that is the craft, the magic of words and contextually determined code, that is the way the phrases are put together and the context is embedded or the context is hidden in some way or the other. Okay, now number two point, a poem is constructed in such a way that it can control its own decoding. I'll explain it to you with the help of a live example, how it controls its own decoding. Now, the third point, the poet uses words in such a manner that the meaning remains fluid. Now, this is what I've been trying to emphasize from the very beginning of the talk, the meaning is fluid, the meaning is not static, static, right? And that is why I say poem has a life, because the meaning changes every now and then. So the meaning remains fluid and relatable for readers according to their own background, culture, or reference. For example, the same piece of poem can give a different meaning and different effect, can leave a different effect on a reader of 15, 16, 17, I mean a teenager, on the other hand, the same piece of poem can leave entirely a different effect on a reader of 50 plus, right? So what I want you all to understand is the same piece of words, the same rhyme, the same pattern, the same structure has two different effects on two different class of readers. Why? Right? So this makes poetry interesting. Okay, now let's get down further. The reader generates meaning from the context as guided by the syntactic, semantic, pragmatic, and discourse elements. This I've already introduced. I don't want to talk on it further. Now, within the narrative and descriptive mode, there lies hidden effects. And this is the magic of poetry, the hidden effect. After reading a piece of poem, sometimes you feel like crying. Sometimes you feel like spouting. Sometimes you feel like immediately calling somebody and sharing your experience. Sometimes you go numb, your eyes are full of tears and you don't know how to express yourself. This is the beauty of a poem. If you really know how to decode a poem, you will never find any poem which would not leave a certain impact, a certain effect on you. It will definitely get influenced, even if it be a nursery rhyme. For example, I, I still remember, you know, when I was a kid, and actually I uh, come from a very typical middle class family, where, and especially I'm a person from Bihar. So, uh, you know, when I was a kid, because uh, I used to go to convent, 
and uh, I had, uh, you know, I was quite fluent with uh, the second language, that is English language, and I used to be side point. So whenever there used to be a few guests, my parents used to call me, Munu, Munu, ya, uncle, I, Kavita suna. So, kaun si Kavita? So, English wali Kavita suna, right? So, I used to recite, you know, those nursery rhymes, those poems, and I used to do it at the top of my voice, and I used to enjoy, and I used to have goosebumps, right? So I still, if you will ask me to recite the same poem even today, I get the same feel, I get the same goosebumps. That is the connect which you establish with poetry and which remains forever. You cannot check it, you cannot control it, you cannot stop it, right? And this is the beauty of literature. Okay, so what I want you to understand is Within the narrative and descriptive mode, there lies hidden effects such as wit, irony, humor, satire, sarcasm, that the imagery, symbols, and metrics may enforce. Right? So we will uh, deal. I, I know I have used a bit of technical terms, but uh, it was necessary. Otherwise, you know, the organizer would have said that I'm not going to invite this person ever again. He talks uh, anything. Okay? So fine. So let's move ahead. The tools. Now, the problem with the tools is before I teach you how to handle tools, I want you to understand why to use tools and what type of tool when you are trying to decode a poem. Look, there is a very simple logic. When it comes to tool, you can decide upon a tool only if you have understood uh, the problem, only if you have understood uh, the the. Uh, operation that anything requires. For example, if I give you a screw, right? I have fixed a screw uh, in a piece of wood, and I ask you to pull it out, and I give you a hammer. Would you be ever able to pull out that screw with the help of a hammer? You can never do that. You'd never be able to do that. So in order to pull out that screw, or in order to pull out that nail that I have already fixed in a piece of wood, you need to need either a screwdriver or a plier, right? So when will you decide out of, like uh, right now, you have a very good mechanical toolbox as your screen. Now, when will you decide which tool is going to help you or which tool is going to fix the problem? Only when you have analyzed the problem first. So try to read a piece of poem first. Try to understand or uncover a poem first. And then you look out for different tools which would help you critically analyze or understand it better. The problem with most of the critics, most of the readers of poetry is we come predetermined, right? We come with a set of prejudiced mind. Okay, today I'm going to read whatever, I'm going to apply decolonization to it. Today, whatever I'm going to read, I'm going to apply post structuralism to it. Today, whatever I'm going to apply, read, I'm going to apply feminism on it. Now the problem is when you come with such a prejudiced mind, obviously you'll not be able to do justice to the piece of text or the poem especially, right? So please don't come with a prejudiced mind. Don't come with a fixed tool. Bring your entire toolbox and don't take any tool out until and unless you have really read the poem twice or twice, until and unless you have really got a first-hand feel of the poem, and only then select your tool, right? This is very important. Now, a few useful techniques. Now, this is my technique. This is what I've been doing. Uh, I think I have time. Yeah, I have time. OK. So these are a few useful techniques that I have been using uh, in my personal, uh, you know, like uh, when I sit in order to analyze a piece of poem or to enjoy a piece of poem, this is how I generally connect with the poem. Okay, I'll, I'll just uh, give it, introduce all this to you. The outside. Look, this is the first and one of the most, uh, you know, preferred or uh, uh, handy tool. The outside. When I say the outside, what I want you to understand is you need to understand the context. You need to understand the outside world or the setting in which the poem is weave or the poem is created. If you're able to understand the setting, if you're able to understand the history, if you're able to understand the geography in which the poem is set, 
it will become very easy on your part to decode the poem right so understand the outside i'll give you the example the example is the first one which you find there ganga din right so some people read it ganga din some people uh, read it ganga din i prefer ganga din okay now ganga din a poem by rudyard kipling i know i i don't know how many of you have read it if you have not read it i advise all of you to read it it's a lovely piece of poem which gives you a very clear idea of what india was in those days what india was when it was a colony of the british empire what india was when it was not independent what india was when the people were you know like slaves slaves to the white skin people right so ganga then or ganga then is you can say a microcosm of the pre independence india how we were tortured how we were abused how we were you know like uh, we had to face a lot and a lot and a lot of uh, you know biasness right now if you really want to enjoy ganga din okay you need to know what is the history what is the setting what used to happen then and only then you will be able to establish a connect with the poem otherwise you will not be able to establish a connect because a person a millennial born you know a person like for example all all of you are very young you would have never thought of the atrocities that your grandparents or your grand grandparents must have uh, you know undergone must have experienced when we were just a colony to the british empire so until and unless you are able to understand that history until and unless you are able to understand what were the conditions social political conditions then you will not be able to connect yourself to this poem so sometimes it becomes very necessary that we understand the outside first only then you will be able to understand the poem the second is inside okay there are a lot of philosophical poems there are a lot of poems which don't require which have no connection with the outside world you just need to close your eyes and look within when you look close your eyes and look within you start enjoying the poem you start understanding the poem okay fine fine yes yes for example i'll, I'll give you the best example for example when you fall in love right you, you you try to find love here and there in the outside world you will find it very confusing right you just close your eyes and you experience the love right so the love that you have with your parents the love that you have with your friends the love that you have with your girlfriend boyfriend right once you close your eyes you will be able to experience it and you can understand a love poem better not by looking at the outside world but closing your eyes and looking inside looking within so that is what i mean by the inside the third is biographical sketching right so sometimes in order to understand a poem you need to understand the personality or the poet right what the poet was going through or you know what were the conditions like there is a very famous saying that any writer or any any uh, author is a product of his time and environment right and it is true right so whatever literature you produce you have a very strong influence of the surroundings okay your environment in which you are living right so sometimes in order to understand a piece of poem you need to understand you know the the biography the biography of a person what type of person he was what type of surroundings he had what type of family relations he had etc etc the other one the out in and in out when i say out in what i uh, want you to understand is you will come across a few poems in which you will have to look at the world first and then compare it with to your personal self you have to make yourself a part of the outside world and only then you will be able to understand the poem right so that is uh, you know for example i i oh, i have a few examples here seven ages of man for example you know uh, this is uh, a piece taken from as you like it william shakespeare there you read about the seven ages of man right you are a toddler and then you are a teenager and then you are a warrior and then you are old age you grow senile etc etc right there are seven ages now you can enjoy this piece of poem right he he starts uh, the poem with uh, you know those famous line this world is a stage right and we all are actors we have our entry we have our exit right very popular lines unforgettable 
right? So you can really enjoy this piece of for this piece of poetry, this piece of write up only if you are able to see yourself as a part of the world. Okay, so you see, you are young right now. So in what stage of life are you? According to Shakespeare, look at your father. What stage of life he or she? Oh, sorry, what stage of life he is? Look at your mother. What stage of life she is? Look at your grandparents. Okay, look at a person who is you know like a revolt. Who is a person? A person like uh, uh, say uh, what? Uh, uh, what? Uh, there is a word i'm not getting it right now who breaks the law all the time and who is a dakat sort of a person a robin hood sort of a personality right so when you look at these all characters in the real world and you connect it to the poem and then you connect the poem to yourself then you really understand what is that you know that uh, poem basically right so that is what i mean by the out in and the in out approach and the last one which i have found to be very effective in my case is exchange you have to step out of your body and get into the body of the author get into the body of the poet get into the body of something else that you are trying to read about right so if you exchange entities you can understand and enjoy a poem better right so these are Uh, like like i'll i'll uh, give you some examples uh, i think i have versa please do let me know if you find me running you know sort of time i'll i'll try to wind up okay sure okay because uh, you know pretty well i'll not stop until and unless you ask me to stop so uh, let me take up a poem like metamorphosis now uh, this is uh, yeah i have already mentioned it a metamorphosis is a poem by eliza griswold in this See, uh, the poem starts uh, with the lines mimosa trees he talks about the mimosa trees the poem starts like this uh, the mimosa trees understand the new year's heat and burst into mustard turfs across the garden right yeah this is it into mustard turfs across the garden and in this poem eliza compares this this whole scene with the scene or with the situation where a girl is getting into her adolescence right so a kid a child moving away from childhood getting into adolescence now the comparison look at the beautiful comparison right she compares a mimosa tree okay which you know uh, which the mimosa tree is generally you know they uh, the fast come very early uh, because they think uh, whatever you know uh, heat they observe or they experience at the new year see they think it is summer right and they bloom very early so see things uh, sorry uh, the poet compares this uh, you know process with the process of a girl getting into her adolescence now you cannot understand this you cannot decode this poem until and unless you really understand how the process takes place right how a mimosa tree flourishes and how a girl becomes uh, like uh, a lady right now let us let us take another example for example yeah the road not taken robert frost and let me inform you i have taken all these examples because i know most of you all must have read all these poems now the road not taken robert frost there are uh, you know like uh, there is a line where he talks about the two roads diverged and then they get got lost in the what in in small uh, shrubs i don't remember exactly i don't know whether i have noted it down somewhere uh no i have not i i think he talks about the undergrowth right so both the roads they go like this and he is not able to see it beyond a certain point because they are lost in the undergrowth right so what is that undergrowth if you are able to look inside right i i don't know how many of you have really analyzed cross to this extent he is talking about the two roads and he he keeps looking at both the roads but he has certain limitations and the limitation is beyond a certain point he is not able to look further the road gets lost and the road gets lost in the undergrowth so if you just close your eyes and you try to analyze these lines what you find is we try our best 
to plan our future but we need to understand as human beings we have our own limitation because after a certain point of time we cannot predict how things are going to turn up right and when we try to stress or think more over it what we try to do is we start creating problem for ourselves that is the undergrowth he is talking about right and in those little problems we lose our track we are unable to see the road further because we have shrouded ourselves with all little problems the undergrowth has overtaken us and we have lost our way right this may be one of the interpretations of road not taken and what i am trying to emphasize or suggest here is i want all of you to be mature and to be independent enough to look beyond the established layers of any piece of text look beyond look into it look further and it will come up with different 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 interpretations and let me inform you in literature every day you experience something new and nobody can say that it is wrong because that person who says that this interpretation is wrong might not be sensible enough to step that is exchange position with you and experience or realize what you are experiencing or realizing right now right so and again i i'll give you another line for example like uh, there is another very famous one daffodils all of us all of us must have read daffodils in daffodils a verse verse says i wandered lonely as a cloud and that floats on a high over waves and hills when all at once i saw a crowd crowd now crowd is generally used for living entities human beings okay but he uses the word crowds for daffodils only because he wants to establish a strong connect here the daffodils are not any flower or not any plant they are living beings right and there is another now look how how he goes against his this idea uh he says that yes i saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze now fluttering and dancing now human beings don't flutter right dancing is okay because human beings dance but why is he using the word fluttering fluttering cannot be used with uh, human being right now in the previous example he uses the word crowd in order to personify daffodils and now again he deep personifies daffodils by using the word fluttering right but again he keeps the meaning intact by again using the verb dance right so what i want you all to understand is a poem has limitless interpretation right we just need to read it in a different way to find a different meaning and the meanings there's plethora of meanings meanings will never end right so start enjoying poetry that is uh, the second advice that i like to give you know if you need to develop that sensitivity you need to be sensitive to a piece of poem and the poem will open up for you right you will not have to look or explore the poem will automatically open up for you and will gift you everything that you are looking forward to right i have taken a few more poems like so this is a wonderful poem by nisi musical if you have not read it read it today right i i am so sorry i am running out of time otherwise i would have read i would have read this poem aloud for all of you so it's such a wonderful poem you will not be able to stop yourself you will have to you know like uh, burst out of laughter right a uh, similar goodbye party to miss pushpa uh, sorry goodbye party for miss pushpa tears right now these poems are humorous but the intention or the purpose is not limited just to create a humorous effect these poems are very satirical as well these poems are very ironical as well it is a very bitter and pungent or you can say caustic remark over the highest strata of the middle class society that once used to speak in english a lot even they were not confident about their second language but they used to you know showcase they used to display they used to like throw it everywhere as if they know english and they used to speak all wrong english 
and they used to take pride in that right so like if you watch some of the bollywood movies in those bollywood movies amita bachchan is a sachin yes in a number of his movies right so that is a very bitter criticism on those people who just try to show off their class by using a language and if you have to show off your class come on language is not um, what language is not a yardstick to really display or to showcase your class right we have a lot of richer languages when we talk about you know indian languages we have sanskrit we have tamil tamil is a very rich language right we have again marathi is a very rich language kannada is a very rich language even hindi right so what i want you to understand is you will find uh, you know like uh, when you are happy when you are uh, like uh, you know uh, you just want to read a piece of poem because you have nothing else to do and you want to while away your time doing something good and you read goodbye party for miss pushpa or you read soap you will burst out of laughter on the other hand if you have met a few people who are living an aristocratic life but they generally don't belong to that class they are just trying to showcase kaise hai na dikhawa karna right uh, so if you meet such people and you come back and you read these poems you will find oh god what a great master is missing right so you know these are a few certain things which you can explore on your own only if you connect yourself to poetry so my basic intention behind this talk is to help you connect and if you are able to connect nobody needs to guide you how to decode a piece of poem right now let us take one poem so that you get the feel that whatever i have proposed till now is actually applicable and practical okay so let us take a poem now here is a twist till now whatever poems i was discussing ganga the metamorphosis daffodils road not taken right night of the scorpion these all poems you all must have read and because we have read those poems and we have a bit of idea about the author sorry about the poet we have an idea about the setting about the background again you know we we uh, it becomes very easy on our part to decode these poems right because there is a lot of outside and inside and the biographical sketch that we know now i am going to take up a poem which is just a surprise for all of you because i have neither given it a title right actually there was no title and i am not able i don't want to disclose the name of the poet until and unless you will ask me in the next 5 minutes sorry in the last 5 minutes so who is the author, who is the poet over there let's take up a poem here they want them to chew now just look the first thing i want all of you to notice is there is no capital letter i don't know how many of you are able to find it look at the poem carefully there is no capital alphabet all small letters right they want them to chew the insects of abuse right now who are these they you don't know because there is no title right and this is the beauty of a poem right so if you have nothing with you to help yourself understand the poem it becomes more interesting right so they want them so definitely the speaker the poet is referring to not one person but to a class or to a section of people okay and again to a different class or a different section of people so what is the first thing we understand there are two different classes there are two different sects there are two different groups okay and notice there is no capital letter capital alphabet that means both these classes are not important you can interpret it that way or they should not be given importance or they don't deserve importance right or they behave very low they maintain a low profile i don't know right let's let's uh, delve further let's get in further they want them to chew the insects of abuse insects right nobody would like to chew insects so that clearly suggests you know abuse uh, when somebody abuses you how difficult you feel what an experience you have right you have the experience of as if you are chewing on insect horrible and return each day and look at the pity look at the uh, you know tragedy 
although you are insulted every day you return every day you have to there are certain set of constraints there are certain restrictions there are certain limitations okay like seamless right now this them right are seamless group of people now another thing i want you all to notice is there is no punctuation mark the whole first stanza there is no punctuation mark so you have to decide how you want to read it how you are breaking it for example i'll i'll just give you two different methods they want them to chew the insects of abuse and return each day like seamless sun which burns itself daily this is one way right now this will give you an entirely a different meaning on the other hand if you break it down this way they want them to chew the insects of abuse and return each day like seamless sun which burns itself daily in its own character for me if you read it like this it will have a very different meaning right now why am i saying this look like seamless sun which if you connect that statement like seamless sun which right here the speaker intends to say or means the sun is seamless because every evening it sinks and again every morning it rises right if you take that meaning right you will get you know exactly a very different meaning of the poem right because the speaker addresses sun as seamless on the other hand if you try to insert a pause between the previous line like seamless and you connect like seamless to each day and them and then start from sun as a fresh statement you will get a different feel again don't forget uh, sorry don't miss again sun s is not capital s is small right so i don't want to give you an exact meaning what i have explored from it i want to leave it open for you but i want you to indicate i want to indicate a few things sun with capital no no capital s it is smallest how can the sun be smallest that means something day this is the first word there must be capital t but it is not capital t it is small t so what the speaker has done is the speaker has undermined the speaker is not happy the speaker is uh, very upset the speaker finds that uh, you know the entire world is uh, not what it is supposed to be because everything is deceptive they are deceptive them are deceptive sun is deceptive so there is deception all around okay and why did i use the word deception why did i use something wrong because a person who is uh, the speaker is not using any punctuation in the first stanza is using three punctuations immediately at short pauses like who's like who's world question mark question mark question mark when do you ask questions just connect it to your life when do you ask questions for example when you are stepping out of your home and your father says ha kahan ja raha hai kyon ja raha hai jana zaruri hai kya now when he asks you a set of questions right person after person after person i hope you understand what i want you to understand right for example you are not convinced uh, with anybody's logic and you immediately pose question after question acha aisa hua kya kyun hua kis liye hua aisa to nahi hona tha right so you pose question after question after question that means you are not ready to take whatever has happened right so i i leave this poem open to you this is not the end of the poem there are two more stanzas to follow okay so i just wanted you to understand or to see how easy it is to decode a poem if you are just calm and you are composed and you really enjoy what you are reading it is as simple as that it never requires the knowledge of all the complicated and complex critical theories to understand a simple piece of poem right now i leave this open for you let it be a task you, you read it again and again and try to come up with different interpretations now i'll just quickly wind up my talk with practically showing you how i analyze or how i decode my poetry or whenever i sit across i confront a poem now in this poem it is very easy because i have already given you 
the title statement okay now this is a poem uh, this is a poem by one of uh, very celebrated you know indian english poets okay his name is ik samna sarma indra kumar sarma he is from rajasthan if you just read they are real and here i have used different colors let me inform you the poet never used different colors this poem was published in black i mean on white pages black and white but i have made it colorful so that i can easily communicate what i want to communicate to you and you will be able to understand how to critically operate a piece of poem okay termites i hope you all know termites they are white ants so the meaning of termites is white ants and i hope you all know what white ant does now look at the poem they are real question the validity of trees on earth grinding teeth they make home in the blood stream of a sprawling paradise vandals underneath have no ears answer no query hear no screams or prayers they block every passage so no one steals a look at their iron appetite and the briskly work trust no one till they have brought the last vision of a dream down to a morphous dust now i i i know i've taken a lot of time so let me quickly jump to the decoding process of this poem now i i just give you 30 seconds just browse through the poem real grinding tree blood stream sprawling paradise wandles still the look iron appetite briskly work trust no one brought the last vision amorphous dust right now if you leave all the other words aside and you select only the colorful words put them together you will easily get the gist of the poem number 1 number 2 what i want what i actually do when i operate when i read a poem how i decode this is it just look at the structure now generating the context for the poem at syntactic and semantic level this is what i have been trying to propose from the very beginning of the talk they what is they they means multiple some people a few things that means we are not talking about a plural subject we are talking sorry we are not talking about a singular subject we are talking about a plural subject here right so they real real means they are not abstract entities but concrete in nature that means they exist they exist what does the poet want to say that they are around us we just need to open your eyes and see so this is a poem where you need that approach of in out you read the poem look into the poem and then look at the world and try to locate oh is it is it really there so when i say real they are not abstract entities but concrete in nature so after reading real here just look at the outside world okay 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 is the poet referring to such people or is the poet referring to such people once you start establishing that connect the poem automatically decodes itself for you and that is how a poem has an inbuilt mechanism which helps you decode the poem right now third thing question question is challenges poses doubt trees trees means we are talking about nature we are talking about living entity trees can be uh you know uh, can denote growth and prosperity right again grinding tree grinding tree is something harsh and cruel bloodstream inner self vital organ paradise when i say paradise what i want you to understand is when the poet says paradise what the poet wants you to understand is something grand or self sufficient vandals are barbarians destroyers or ruiners iron appetite that means insatiable hunger your hunger is never satiated you want to go on eating and eating and eating i'll give you the best example the the no i don't want you to give you that example otherwise you'll understand the whole poem okay there are a set of people who are never happy who are never satisfied let let us uh, talk for example you know politicians right they involve themselves into different scams and they want money and money and money and money more money more money they fail to understand that they have amassed so much of wealth that they can't spend it that is useless that is waste they are wasting their precious life amassing wealth which is of no good use this is just an example of iron appetite okay and iron appetite can also refer to immense destructive capability be careful 
if I have an iron appetite, that means I can destroy anything. Okay? And let me inform you the white ants, the small ants, they are very small, but they have a very powerful acid with which they can destroy anything. Okay? So, again, last reason something complete and worthy of admiration amorphous dust, complete ruin, or of no value. Now, I'm just trying to help you construct the context for this poem. The possible context can be nature. When I say if the context is nature, who are they? They are those white ants which spoil a big wood, I mean a big tree. The white ants which spoil a big furniture, right? The context can be political. When if the context is political, who are those? They, they are the politicians. The politicians who are not honest, they are like white ants, they are like, you know, parasites. They are eating away, you know, the country on the name of serving it, right? If the context is turned to religious, who are these uh, religious they? The religious they are people like Asaram, people like uh, that fellow who is a Ram Rahim something, right? They have hijacked religion. They have you know, hijacked religion, they have, uh, what is that? They have, uh, you know, uh, kidnapped religion and they are misguiding the entire world, right? If the context is spiritual, it will have a different meaning. If the context is social, it will have a different meaning. Now, what I want you to understand is this simple poem can be understood, can be decoded in five or six or maybe more different contexts, different pragmatic levels. And if you decode this poem at different pragmatic levels, you will come up with a very distinct and different interpretation. And that is the beauty of poem. Because in poetry, there is no one-to-one -one relationship. There is no one-to-one -one word and meaning relationship. There is one-to-many. Okay? So there is that word, sorry, there is that sub to earth, right? Sub to abhipraya. So it is multiplex in nature. There is always a multiplicity of meaning working at the very base of any poem. And it's very easy to decode it. You just need to be or develop a taste for poetry right so with this i'd like to put an end to my talk i know i have taken a lot of time actually i wanted to discuss a few more points but the time is uh, like is not allowing me to it is too much so no, i think you can discuss a few more points actually we have some time uh, so you can continue no actually i will not be able to give time for the interaction it's okay but i have given them enough uh, too much, right. they'll not be able to digest. Okay, so with this, I thank you all for being such patient listeners. And now I'm open for questions. If you have any questions, if you have any doubt, if you don't agree to me, you are welcome. You can disagree, but you will have to give me a strong reason why you don't agree to whatever I have said. Okay, so with this, I'm open for questions. You all can clarify, you all can discuss. So over to Varsa. Varsa, please take over. Thank you very much, sir, for the very charged session on uh, decoding poetry. I think the students would now you know, feel better equipped to read and understand poems with help of the tools which you have provided them. Um, so students, the session is open for your questions. If you have any questions, if you want, if you want <coughs> to say something, please get back to us quickly. Hello, ma'am. This is Shweta. Good afternoon. Hello, Shweta. Uh, ma'am, I'm going to ask, sir, first, uh, when we start decoding poems, should we go on to the nature or the atmosphere of the uh, poem on which it has been written or to the words it, uh, it contains? Hello, sir. Yeah, Rizwa. Uh, who is this? Is this Rizwan? Shoeba. Shoeba. Shoeba Okay, okay. Shoeba, could you please repeat that last word? Uh, I, I couldn't get it clearly. I'm so sorry. 
Okay, okay, fine, sir, fine, sir. I yeah, can. Yeah. Sir, uh, I want to ask you that when I, whenever I go to decode a, such a poem, any of them, so whether I go to the atmosphere or the background of the poet, what it has been on written, or to the words it has contained or going to contain, or the double meanings of the word. Okay, dear. I I got it. Anything else you'd like to add to it? No, sir. It's fine. It's not. Okay, dear. Now, sir, look. This is what I have been, you know, trying to emphasize, trying to propose from the very beginning of the talk. What I have said is, I have given you all the four or five effective techniques, right? Okay. One is the outside, the other is the inside, the other is in out, the fourth is out in, and then you need to exchange all those things, right? Now, don't limit yourself, further, right? Never limit yourself. Now, look, what happens is when you get a piece of poem, right? You immediately decide that I'm going to interpret it or I'm going to understand it only in this particular context. So you try to you you generally prejudice your mind. So if you are already you know if you have already decided that I'm going to approach this poem in a political context or I'm going to approach this poem in a social context or I'm not going to. Uh, look at the outside setting of the poem. I'm just going to delve deep into the poem, and I'm going to analyze the structure of a poem. I'm going to study the sounds. I'm going to study the similes. I'm going to study the metaphors, and I'm going to find out how this poem works. What you are doing is, you know, you are leaving one aspect or one important side of it. I'll give you the best example. So, you must have gone to parties, right? And when you go to buffets. When you go to buffet, you have wide range of cuisines, wide range of dishes. If you have already made up your mind that today I am going to eat only vegetarian food, definitely you are going to miss the delicacies of the non-vegetarian food. On the other hand, if you go to a party saying that no, today I am on a diet and I am not going to eat anything, I am just I am just going on liquid diet. I'll take a few cups of ice cream. You are going to miss all of the rest. So why to go to a buffet with a predetermination that I'm going to eat only biryani or I'm going to eat only rice and dal, right? You go there with with no nothing, nothing. Just open up yourself. You look at the recipes. You look at the different. You feel it, and then you taste whatever you want to. The more number of items you taste, the more you enjoy, right? So I don't want you to limit yourself. when it comes to decoding poetry don't limit yourself to any one aspect of it or any one you know bend of it open up you analyze the poem yeah, from four or five different angles yes. open minded and to be black blank minded when i'm going to read such a poem which uh thinking of that i'm not going to decode it i'm going oh. to read it and they have all the flavors and aspects of the poem okay dear i understood exactly what you are facing look if you read a poem and you go blank that means one thing very clearly that means you are not in a good mood take a break come back to the poem after half an hour or come back to the poem after two days and i promise you you will find a meaning in it right so it it's it's necessary to be cheerful when you are going to read a poem it's necessary to be calm and composed sometimes so, what happens you know when you are cheerful you you try to you know force a positive meaning into a negative setting again you know that will uh, you know that will revert that is not the right practice so be too look i don't be too depressed don't be too excited you just be calm and composed and enjoy right and i promise you one thing you will never come across any poem to which you will not be able to connect if you are calm and composed i promise you this so if you are going blank after reading a poem that means that is not the right time to read that poem you come back to the poem after some time and things will automatically be sorted out right rizwan okay sir thank you so much sir you are welcome dear thank you thank you sir question sir dr ram sir can i hear you sir is it edison yeah of course Um, oh, you... oh. Yeah, nice so we have we have Edison. a genius here. He is Thomas Alva Edison. 
Yeah, fine. He's a celebrity in South India. Uh, you can see. Yeah, yeah. Please, I don't want to waste your time. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. So first of all, I wish to thank uh, uh, the management who organized such a, a great event, and then uh, you, your presentation is such a wonderful one. Uh, anyhow, you would have connected lots and lots of points um, uh, for especially this decoding, right? So here okay. I have a doubt. How how do you decode uh, this particular poem, this Nizam musical? Whereas you compare with the, uh, you would have uh, given this Robert Frost road not taken, and also you quoted this Nizam musical Night of Scorpion. Yeah, yeah. So can you give an idea about this decoding of this Nizam musical in the Night of Scorpion? Okay, fine. Definitely, I'll do that. Night of Scorpion. I okay. Look, uh, when it comes to you know decoding a poem, it is a time-consuming process. I I would not like to decode the entire poem for you right now, but I'll just give you an example how to go about it, and I think that will help you. In uh, the Night of the Scorpion, there are a few keywords. I'll I'll give you a few. to crawl beneath a sack of rice right here the poet is talking about the scorpion that has crawled beneath the sack of rice now the sack of rice is a symbol here the sack of rice has worm and that is why the scorpion is trying to crawl into it right now i'll i'll give you some more the peasants come like swarms of flies and look look at the irony here the people right the people the human beings who are peasants in this given poem they have been compared to swarms of flies why it is only because of their living standard what they face their life is no better than flies right which take birth and die one day without contributing anything such a futile life again i'll i'll give you some more and bust the name of god a hundred times right so they bust the name of god 100 times this is such a mechanical process when you are buzzing the name of god if you stay calm and if you just think of uh, the lord the almighty the bhagwan and you should lose account if you lose a track of your count if you are counting something you are just trying to please yourself you are engaged in a mechanical process and that is not the right way to appease god right so these poor people right these illiterate people they are neither living a good social life nor they have good economics to back them nor they have good spiritual backing so they are just living like flies i'll i'll give you some again with candles now this is very important thomas uh in in third or fourth stanza uh, ezekiel says with candles and with lanterns throwing giant scorpion shadows right so look at it they are trying to locate one small scorpion and how are they trying to locate it with the help of lanterns with the help of candles and the image of these candles or the shadows of these candles or lanterns looks to be a bigger scorpion so here is a comparison the comparison is between the real scorpion and the virtual scorpion which is inside them right so when you are talking about the bigger shadow of a scorpion actually you are undermining or you are criticizing these human beings who are behaving worse than the scorpion did the scorpion bit the lady only to safeguard its interest but these people are ready to kill the scorpion under a superstitious belief that if they are able to kill the scorpion the lady would be saved right now again again uh, let me come to another important uh, yes the person puts paraffin oil and burns a match right so there is a beautiful line over there thomas i watched the flame feeding on my mother i watched the flame feeding on my mother in hindu right you being a christian but you must be aware in hindu when the fire feeds on you when you are no more when you are dead that is a funeral fire but his mother is living still she is being fed right there is a living fire the fire feeds on her this is such a strong such a strong you know image because people are superstitious because people are illiterate because people are not mature they put paraffin and they burn a, 
a living lady, right? Only under the pretext that okay, it might uh, get her free of the toxin. And let me, uh, you know, the, the most touching lines. Any person who has a sense of language and who has a connect with his or her mother will definitely be filled with tears when you read these lines. My mother only said, "Thank God." The scorpion picked on me and spat and speared my children. Look at the love. Look at the connect. This is the selfless love which a, which a mother has for a child. Now, now let me get back to the question. The question was, how can you decode, right? Now, this is one poem. I'm not asking you to take up any other poem or physical. You take any such similar poem that celebrates motherhood, that celebrates the relationship of mother and children. And when you read that poem, you just try to compare and contrast the ideas. Which is shared, the images, the metaphors, right? The way it is conveyed, and I can guarantee you, you will be able to decode any piece of poem. Thomas, I, I think I have addressed, I have answered your query. Yeah, 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 right, uh, right, Ram. It's good. Uh, nice explanation. Uh, nice presentation. I thank once again the organizers as well as you, Ram. For a good uh, very, Yeah, so uh, for a better explanation, you can come back to me. We'll sit together and I'll explain you better things. <laughs> okay, Ram. Let me let me discuss. Uh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, hereafter, you you have any kind of uh, presentation? Will you please send the link? This is the link which uh, I received from Dr. Wilson Jethi. Fine. So whether you are going to present in a topic, this is my personal uh, suggestion. Uh, I ask you please send the share, send the link to me, and definitely we shall join together and then we shall discuss a lot. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, the organizers. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much, Ram. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Thomas. Yeah, any other queries? Thank you. So yes, we uh, so we have some questions in the chat box. Okay, Vasha. We can check it. I I where would I find it? Uh, okay. Hello, Doctor. Uh, right. Yeah, is, is this is a known voice? Is uh, it? This. Oh, Ramiz. Yes. Yeah, yeah Ramiz. this is Ramiz. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I I have a small question, but uh, yeah, it's a little different from what we are discussing right here. Okay. Um, my my question is from the poet's perspective, basically. Okay. Yeah. So when we write something, we have a certain thought in mind, right? Yes. Uh, when we have a reader or an audience, we want them to take exactly what we are giving, especially yeah. when we have a live audience. Yes. So, but it doesn't happen every time. It will never happen, Ramesh. So, any suggestion you know, on this, how to achieve yes. this? Yes, I can. I can definitely, because you share the same area of interest as I do. And uh, now, look. The first thing is that you need to understand the constraints of language here. Don't yeah. forget that poem. Poem is just a construct of language, and a language has its own constraints. And the first constraint of the language is it is incomplete. Language, when you try to communicate or encode a message. help of any language definitely by the time it reaches the reader or it reaches the audience a part of it is lost right this is the first constraint that the language has the second constraint is there are n number of variables that are working when you are interacting with anybody n number of variables for example you need to understand and it is impossible to saturate all of them let me inform you ramesh be very frank being very frank with you it is impossible to saturate all the variables because in the in the group of audience if there is somebody who is having a tough time if there is somebody who is drunk if there is somebody who is under the influence of some other uh, thing if there is somebody who has another appointment if there is somebody who has never experienced what you are talking if there is somebody who has a very a uh, different approach and who is stubborn you can never satiate the expectations of such an audience and this this audience this class of audience will never reach you will never be able to reach this class of audience now look i cannot give you a formula with which you will be able to come over it because there is no such formula but you can minimize the gap and in order to minimize the gap the best way is you need to analyze your audience before you start speaking 
so when you are going for a public platform right you should do your homework what sort of audience you are going to talk to for example if you are going to a college if you are going to present if you are going to a musaira where you will find the target audience is in the age group of say 20 to 35 right you need to do your homework what would be interesting to the age group of 20 to 35 what are the current topics what is the climate there what how how, how what is the nature of the people that i'm going to address and if you are able to analyze the audience you will be able to equip yourself better you will be able to prepare better right this is the only way you can do it from is because there is no 100% formula there is no sure set formula with which you can overcome the constraints of a language language has its only language has a lot of constraints and one constraint is it is never able to carry the same message in the same amplitude and frequency as encoded by the uh, sender right from is yes sir so you can only minimize it yeah right so i guess i i'll have to work on this yes you have to work on it and you have to do your homework so i advise you before you go for a public uh, uh, program before you go to address public you analyze the set of audience there are a few keywords which i can give the key parameters are the age group of the audience the background of the audience the education class or the economical background of the audience and the interest of the audience right if you are able to take care of these few parameters you will be able to perform better thank you okay thank, thank you for bringing okay to thank us. you yeah varsha okay so thank you very much a next question is coming up from one of your very dear juniors uh, archana sinha is here to ask a question Okay, Archana is there. Look, it brings a smile on my face. <laughs> yeah, what is the question, uh, Varsha? Varsha, I'm not able to see the chat. Okay, I can see the chat. Oh, Archana is here live. Yes, and and she'll she'll okay. ask you the question directly. She'll speak out the question for you. Yeah, Archana, please. How are you doing? I can't hear you, dear. I think your mic is on mute. No, I can't hear. Yes, it. there is But some uh, trouble with the mic. What I'll do is I'll read out her question. Yeah, please. Okay, so Archana's question is: Can you explain poetry as meditation in the present scenario of COVID nineteen? Ah, okay, Archana. Uh, good that you connected uh, my session with COVID nineteen. It's always good to talk about the current things. Otherwise, I feel outdated. Okay. the first thing is covid 19 now covid 19 is a pandemic and each and every living being i say each and every living being on this planet is affected by it so how can poetry be untouched definitely poetry is influenced or is you know in a way you know uh, like affected by it now when you talk about meditation the one thing which i have been trying to emphasize from the very beginning of my talk is you can understand a piece of poem only when you are calm and composed so in order to decode the poem the best you need to be in a state of calm and composed right and what is meditation as far as i as far as i understand meditation is a start of relaxing your mind relaxing yourself and attaining that stage of calmness attaining that stage of composure so you asked me a question that is the very crux or the base of my entire presentation if you have to decode a poem whether it be in the covid context or it be in any other context you need to have that art of meditation to help you out you meditate first and then read a poem otherwise read a poem and meditate then because until and unless you meditate you will never understand you will never connect yourself with the poem as simple as that actually yeah sir i think i justified thank you yes 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 you did and you did really well uh, there is another question by a student komal gupta okay uh, and the question is 
sir, you told that we get different understanding according to our mood or situation when we yes. read a poem. Yes. I want to ask that don't we get any issues or problems if we understand poems feeling or meaning according to us and not by the perspective of the poet? I think you have discussed that this, but she has. A I did, but yeah, I'd like to throw some more light on it. Look, dear, the first thing, the term poet, okay, is abstract. There is no poet. Let me inform you. Now, again, uh, you know, uh, some of you might uh, take your guards on. What is this person saying? There is no poet, okay? There is no poet in the poem, right? Once a person has composed or weaved or created a few lines and left it for the audience or has donated it to a set of readers or has got it printed, he or she is dead then and there, right? So the poet is dead. Hey, you, you must have come across the term. You must be knowing that concept. The author is dead, right? So if the author is dead, how can the poet be alive? And why to worry about somebody who is not living? So the poet is dead. So why do you worry about the poet's aspect? There is no poet's aspect. When you take up a poem, it is your poem. And you make it your poem. It is nobody's poem, right? When I read The Road Not Taken, it is not Robert Frost I'm reading. It is, I'm, I'm trying to connect it to myself, right? So what I want you to understand is, don't try to constrain yourself to understand a piece of poem only in the preview of what the writer thought of, or the writer was experiencing, or the writer was feeling when he or she composed that piece, okay? And that is the right way of doing it. Otherwise, literature will succumb, literature will die, literature will collapse. You know, literature lives only because it has multiple heads. In order to smother, in order to kill something, you need to know where is the head. Literature has no head, right? There are multiple millions of heads. So when you take up a piece of art, whether it be prose or it be poem, or it be a painting, don't try to find an interpretation from somebody else's point of view. You are the sole independent authority. You can decode it the way you want. The only thing you have to be careful about it, you should be able to justify. If I say this poem is vulgar, I need to give you enough examples from the poem why it is vulgar. If I say this poem is beautiful, I should give you enough examples from the poem why it is beautiful. If I say this poem is inspirational, I should be able to give you examples why this poem is inspirational. And that is it. For example, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you have read the poem If by Rudyard Kipling, right? A very popular, very famous poem. If, when you are reading If, you get the feel as if you are talking to yourself and your inner voice, your inner voice encourages you to do certain things which you are not able to do till now. If not this, if this, if not this, if this, right? So you feel as if the Rudyard Kipling, there is no Rudyard Kipling there, right? You connect it to your soul and your soul challenges you, encourages you. Yeah, fine, you can do it. Why can't you do it? I should be able to do it. I need to come over, right? So that is how you should, that is how I decode my poetry. It is up to you how you decode yours, but I suggest you decode it this way and then you will enjoy it, right? Yeah, sir. So, okay, thank you. So we have one more final question from a student. Okay. And it's related to your answer, you know, the answer which you gave, it, it is somehow connected. The question is in some poems, words are bitter, hard. How can we face that? OK, fine, good. Now, this is the only question for which you know, like I'm taking some time. OK, fine. Uh, look, the concept of bitterness or the concept of rudeness or the concept of black, you must have read the concept. You must have read the theory which says everything uh, you know exists in this world in binary opposites right if i say something is rude 
that means i must have experienced something that is really gentle something that is really humble if i call something bitter that means i must have tasted what is sweet right now when it comes to bitter or rude words right you can easily deal with it if you are trying now look look now i am just taking a u turn till now i was suggesting you establish a connect get connected with the poem now i am propagating now i am proposing try to you know dissociate from the poem don't link your personal identity with the poem try to get up from it so if a poem has rudeness if a poem has something bitter you try to analyze it or decode it from a neutral perspective without getting yourself connected to it because you will definitely get influenced if you establish a personal connect to the poem which i have been asking you to do but in order to safeguard your interest whenever you find negative energy coming from anywhere as human beings as intellectuals it is our right to safeguard our interest now this is one take this might not be applicable all the time so i'll give you another another way how to save that or how to see yourself look there is nothing bitter or there is nothing sad or there is nothing you know vulgar it all lies in the perception it all lies in the perception right now as i have said every word has three meanings right abhida lakshana and vyanjana right so the denotative connotative and the implied so whenever you confront a word which is bitter it will be bitter only at the abhida level that is denotative level for example if i say you are a rascal or that little rascal now look rascal is a bitter word if you look at it denotatively you will find rascal is a negative term but you when you connect it to the context you might come up with a positive meaning of the word rascal rascal can be a small mischievous child so if i say you little rascal and if my tone is not ironical or my tone is not harsh that rascal sounds sweet to me right for example when you know when friends talk okay i because this is uh, an academic forum and everything is on record i don't want to use some uh, you know other words but let me inform you what happened when you talk to your friends how many times do you use abusive words how many times do you use bitter words how many times do you use negative terms but do you really think those negative terms are you know they suggest the same meaning no the implied meaning is something else right for example when i meet my friend after a long time i said kutta right but i don't want to call him kutta that kutta has a different meaning right so whenever you have a bitter word you don't look at the denotative word you come to the connotative level and the vyanjana that is the implied meaning and implied meaning can never be rude implied meaning can never be bitter okay because like there you, you just need to understand how the concepts work like I, i'll give you a better example there is a concept of nakedness and there is a concept of nudeness right nakedness is vulgar naked looks vulgar right but when i say new it looks soft new is a form of art for example if you go to egypt if you go to old caves if you go to temples you find nudity everywhere but you know that is not art that is a part of life so you just need to change the way you are looking at things right so if you find something bitter or something hard you just try to look at it from some different angle and i can guarantee you you will be once you move from abhida level to lakshana and vyanjana level you will not find it bitter or vulgar anymore this is a promise you try doing it and you will find it successful yeah varsha thank you i think that was enough there are few more you know two three questions uh, but they are based on you know how to perform a piece of poem okay. so i don't know perform if you would like uh, to take the them perform yes like a question is uh, according to you 
how much attention we must give to physical actions and facial expressions while reciting a poem okay fine uh, dear uh, whoever is the learner whoever is the student who has asked me this let me inform you one thing there is no need to control your physical activity or your facial expression or your movements there is no need to do all this you just need to do one thing whenever you are presenting a poem you get into the poem you immerse yourself in the poem and i promise you there will be no need you will not even have to look at your body language the body language is already you know your body is already designed crafted in such a way by the almighty that your body is mature enough to look after itself so you try you don't try to control your eye movements you don't try to control your hand movements you don't try to control your you know the proxemics that you are maintaining on stage you just get into your poem you start enjoying your poem and your enjoyment your pleasure will come to the surface and that will take care of the entire physical attributes that you are worried about as simple as that yeah sir thank you thank you uh, i think the we have one final question okay it's from noshaba naz what are you use the question final is, four times it's okay fine i'm uh, enjoying it it's <laughs> It's five nineteen, and we have the final question. It's okay, Varsha. I was just feeling, you know, my habit. Yeah, please go ahead. Wait. I'm sorry to bother okay. you. Yeah. Well, you can. You certainly can, sir. Some can compose the best lines when depressed. Some when extremely happy. What role does situation play in composing words, especially? Okay, fine. Uh, let me inform you something. Word is something that is not created. Okay, you cannot create a word. a word is just you know it comes automatically to you it will come let it come you don't try to find words let me inform you if you just like right now i'm talking to you and all of a sudden you will ask me to write a poem or create a haiku i'll take my pen i'll take my notepad and i'll think i'll stress myself and so i'll start writing something this will never be the best piece of poem that i can create because the words will not come right look you need to believe in one thing this world is created by a force which is beyond our comprehension right and language is the first gift that the muses have given us right so don't try to control language you just try to surrender to the language and the language will automatically bless you now your your main uh, point was sometimes when we are depressed we create the best line sometimes we are excited we create the best line let me inform you you will create the best than sorry the better than the best lines when you are neither excited nor you are sad when you are calm and composed you try it once so if you have if you think that you write better when you are depressed or if you think you write better when you are excited or you are happy let me inform you this is a myth you will write your best when you are neither excited nor sad now why do you feel that you write best when you are unhappy or you are happy this is because look this whole world is a construct of energies right different types of energies the positive and the negative energies both exist simultaneously when you are unhappy you lock yourself down you don't want to open up right when you are unhappy you don't want to go and talk to anybody you want to lock yourself down when you lock yourself down knowingly or unknowingly you get into the stage of meditation you start meditating you start thinking why is it happening to me why only me this world is such a biased place i don't want to live any more and you create a very strong negative feel because you have created a very strong negative feel all negative terminology will start coming to you 
all difficult negative terms will come to you and you will put all those negative terms on a piece of paper and because those are the unusual words which you generally don't use you think it is the best of your writing and the same happens vice versa when you are excited when you are excited you create a very positive energy around you and when you create a positive energy around you all positive things will come to you and you capture all those positive things put it on paper and you think this is the best because those positive things have never come to you till date but let me assure you you will write your best when you are neither excited nor you are sad this is it yeah varsha any more final questions no no more final questions okay. with this we come to the end of the uh, the questionnaire session and um, yes you said it very right we write our best when we are absolutely calm we are composed and we don't have any exaggerated emotions now what so, i'm surprised uh, is no, no, what i'm surprised is varsha nobody till now has asked me who is the poet who is the poet of that poem that anonymous poem i feel so pity anyway i yeah, think varsha. some uh, i think a lot of people know that is why they are not mentioning do you know okay. who is the poet any one of you do you know who is the poet yes they they keep following you right okay good yes <laughs> okay so with this we come uh, to the end of this session i think students are sending up thank you so much for this very amazing session sir uh, they are writing messages to you thank you sir and thank you ma'am for such a wonderful session uh, thank you all for very nice session yeah so you have got a lot of you know great comments you can check them out in the chat section if you okay. are able to access the chat yes section. yes no no i can actually till now i was so lost in the talk i never cared to see where is the chat now yes. i'm done with it and now i'm seeing it okay okay somebody suggested me in the very beginning be little slow and i'm seeing it right now oh god anyway it's fine yeah yeah varsha is is it's your okay. day yeah so uh, th thank you thank you very much everybody for joining us and thank you thank you ram sir for you know this great session this power packed session the it was all my sir madam you're welcome yeah and i don't want to thank you more because uh, you know whenever we wish to call you back we can get back to your shoulders again and say you know another session with you so okay. uh, it was a pleasure having you here and uh, we would be glad if you continue you know getting back to us with your you know such power packed sessions and keep enriching us you know i got reminded of a lot of things when you used to teach us how to understand poetry how to translate them how to crack the codes and everything i got you know reminded of so many things you know a lot of memories got a fresh so thank you for uh, taking us back to those memories you know it was a revisiting experience I'm and now glad that you agreed for the session. Okay, fine. <laughs> Continue. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, thank you very much officially for uh, you know uh, joining us for this session. Uh, we would be getting back to you again and again for more such power pack power pack session from you. Thanks a lot. You can check out the chat box session, and then you know you can plan to leave. So, thank you, everybody. for being with us any final words you would like to you know say to the students yeah well, sir uh, look uh, when it comes to final words uh, it becomes very difficult for me because i don't believe anything is the end of anything but still okay final words for the session look my intention was not to confuse you i don't know how many of you Uh, i know a few of you might have got confused with my approach but let me promise let me assure you one thing if you are feeling confused uh, it clearly indicates that you are somewhere you know lacking behind in maturity and i rushed through a lot of things in the limited span of time right so this might be another reason that you find oh god because i kept throwing information after information boom 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 right and you had no time to collect all of it 
so you might be feeling that you are in a state of uh, you know unknown territory you are stuck into some unknown territory or you are confused or you are lost somewhere look even if you are able to carry with you four or five simple things which i have suggested that would be good enough to help you decode a poem further right and i never intention to give you a strong set of rules and that was the reason i didn't talk about any critique i didn't talk about eliot i didn't talk about richard i didn't talk about aristotle i didn't talk about all those things because i wanted you all to understand that literature is something that nobody needs to teach you literature is something that you will learn on your own you just need to open up yourself right so this was my intention and it was an amazing audience because all of you were able to bear and yes another thing you know as soon as guru nanak college uh, dhanbad posted it on their web page that uh, my details that we have a session of this and this person immediately i posted a cartoon deal with it right i don't know how many of you have looked at it so i think i have justified that cartoon deal with it because i really made your life difficult but my intentions were pretty clear i just wanted to help you understand that literature is something which will automatically come to you if you open your eyes that is it thank you thank you versa the privilege has been all mine thank you all thanks a lot thank you very much so with this we come to the end of the session okay. thanks a lot everybody for joining in and this is for everybody's information that was recorded and the link would, would be provided to everybody for their revision and for further distribution purposes so thank you everybody again we would get back to few more amazing sessions like we had today uh, you know with this i say you all good luck take care have great time ahead namaskar